Thanks be to God. Uh, I am acutely aware if you are like watching our worship online or like later in the week you tune in and you see like all this space stuff and you're wondering what's going on. Um, I, I got I to gotta confess in the front, if I was a better pastor, this would all tie into the sermon. It's not gonna, okay? So it's just VBS and I love it. Um, but I, I want to recap a little bit about what we talked about last week um, because I kind of want to pick up where we ended. So last week, we talked about the experience of the Spirit living in us. We said uh, that part of the way that we are visibly united as the people of God is in recognition that nobody's more spiritual than anybody else, that um, I'm not closer to God than you are, that Presbyterians aren't closer to God than Methodists are, that our church isn't closer to God than somebody else's church, that in fact what makes us spiritual is that we have the Spirit living inside us, and the Spirit comes and lives in all people who accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We talked last week about this idea um, that something radical happens in that moment um, when the Spirit comes into our lives, um, we are transformed. And we talked about how in the Old Testament, people only got a little bit of the Spirit, Um, but that in the New Testament in Christ, we get the whole shebang. And then we ended last week by talking about um, this idea that we are called to be cups Um, and that if we want to be visibly united to each other and to Christ… Um, Our goal isn't just to get the bad stuff out of our life, like getting the air out of a cup, but to be filled with the good stuff of God, to be filled with the Spirit, like pouring water in a cup gets the air out. After our worship service last week, as um, we were going through the perjury line, everybody was saying, good job, pastor, Um, (laughs) perjury line. Anyway, um, one of my uh, friends said, hey, Jim, um, I have a question for you. I like the cup thing, but how do you keep your cup full? I thought, that is a great question. How do you keep your cup full? And so I've been thinking about that this week, and I think it relates to Paul's ongoing message. Uh, And and what occurred to me is um, it is the right question, but it presumes something confusing. Uh, So um, work with me for a minute. Um, This is not going to be a perfect metaphor, okay? Um, But it's going to work a little bit. So uh, I've got a cup and I want to be filled with the Spirit of God, and this is the Spirit of God, and this is just a bucket so I don't make a mess on the floor, okay? It doesn't fit in. Uh, So, um, here's the issue. Um, There is plenty of Spirit to fill up my cup, Um, but my little paper cup's got a problem. It's not working great. Okay. Um, We're going to just see what happens if I put that there for a while. Uh, the, The problem is not with the water. What's the problem with? cup, right. Uh, the issue isn't the water, the issue is the vessel. Uh, and, and the key question in the spiritual life is not, how do I get more water in my cup? The key question in the spiritual life is, um, how do I become the sort of vessel that can be filled with the Spirit of God and stay full, right? And this is such a helpful idea for me because I think this is more or less the message that Paul is trying to communicate to the church in Corinth. He says, um, you are filled with the Spirit because you are Christians. Everybody gets the Spirit. But what you do with the Spirit, right, the kind of vessel that you are, will determine um, how you live your life with or without God. And this is going to be messy. All right, we're going to just do that. I'm just going to leave those there for a while and see what happens. Uh, Paul actually doesn't use the metaphor of cups. Paul uses the metaphor of buildings. Um, But I think it's the same idea. Um, Paul describes us as vessels, as buildings, as temples in which God lives by His Spirit. Paul says our buildings are built on the foundation of Jesus, but we add to our buildings with our lives. In other words, we get to uh, affect the kind of cups that we are. Uh, And Paul uses a whole bunch of metaphors to describe those cups uh, or those buildings. And and, um, I want to suggest really simply that all those metaphors fall into two categories. Um, There are lives of earthly significance, and there are lives of eternal significance. 
Okay? It's that simple. Uh, and so I wrote the word significance down in advance because I'm not a good speller and I still spelled it wrong. Um, but I want to think a little bit about lives of earthly significance today and lives of eternal significance. And I think it'll be helpful for us to begin by reflecting on Paul's um, various metaphors, because as we went through this passage, we heard a lot of things. Um, so, uh, if you've got a Bible in front of you and you've got 1 Corinthians chapter 3 still open, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if we can do this together a little bit. Um, there are at least two really big metaphors that Paul uses in this chapter. Um, look at the first few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and um, what does Paul call them? He says, you are infants. Okay, fantastic. He says they're infants, right? And what do infants drink? Milk. All right, fantastic. Um, there's another… We're, we're going to come back to the alternative in a minute. Uh, well, let's just… No, we'll come back to it in a minute. Um, there's another big metaphor he uses. Actually, he's going to talk about planting and watering the ground, um, which is cool, but we're not going to go there this morning. Th there's another metaphor he uses in verses 10 through 15. What does he talk about? Builders, fantastic, master builders. Um, and he talks about um, buildings that are built with different materials, okay? And I'm going to say here, under earthly significance, we're talking about building with wood and hay and straw. And I ran out of space. Okay. Uh, there are a few other things that Paul pulls out here. Um, he's going to talk about being merely human, um, which I, I really think is an interesting concept, merely human. And um, I think that, 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 that'll do it for now. You can leave your Bibles open. We might come back to the Bible. You just never know. Okay, um, here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand that, that Paul, in speaking to the Corinthians, is saying, hey, um, I am concerned that even though you are Christians, you're living lives that are focused on earthly significance. Okay? Now, this is a really important caveat. Everybody that Paul is writing to, by and large, is already a believer in Jesus. He's writing to the church, right? So he is assuming that they all believe in Jesus. They're all going to die and go to heaven, right? And, and he even says this. He says, uh, the foundation is Jesus Christ, right? And you're all building on the foundation. So, I mean, the really simple gospel message, right, that Jesus, fully human, fully God, lives a perfect life, dies on the cross for our sins, rises from the dead, breaking the power of sin and death, and invites us to be part of His life through faith. Paul's assuming they get that, okay? In fact, um, Paul's saying in a really simple way that that message I just told you is like the milk of faith, okay? He's saying um, that message that Jesus died for us, rose for us, that we can be united to Him, we can live forever um, because of our faith in Him. That's like the basic Christian message that I expect you all to get. And Paul says, here's the problem, is that it's been a while since I shared that message with you. It's been a while since you gave your lives to Jesus. It's been a while since you began building on the foundation of that of that bedrock of Christ's work for you. And yet I come back, and that's all it seems like you're ready to hear. Um, just imagine for a minute if you were in school or at work, and during your lunch hour or your lunch break, the person next to you um, opened up their lunchbox, and they pulled out a baby bottle and they drank every day from that baby bottle um, in their cubicle next to you or at the lunch table next to you while you're having your sandwich, right? The first time that might be like weird, but then you're like eventually freaking out. Like what's the deal with this dude, right? This is what Paul's saying that a lot of Christians are doing. You're just focused on the milk and you need to move on to solid food. So Paul says, hey, it's, it's not enough just to believe in Jesus. I mean, that is all you need for salvation. Yeah, absolutely. It is enough. Um, but that's not the end of the Christian life, that there is a whole response that comes in light of the gospel message. And you guys need to start living into that response. You need to move from just milk to solid food. 
You need to start building with materials that will last, that can be effective vessels that contain the Spirit and cooperate with the Spirit. So, uh, he says, when you are consumed with division, when you're arguing with each other, when you're debating about which Christian is the best Christian or which denomination is the best denomination or um, what uh, pastor is the best pastor, um, when you are arguing about who is closer to God, I'm a better Christian than you are, then you are missing the point, right? You are, you are not ready for solid food. You're building with things that don't last. And he says, th- this is a reality for all of us after we accept Jesus, after we are um, given the Holy Spirit, what changes? What changes in our lives? Do, do our lives become focused on eternal significance, or do they stay focused on things of merely earthly significance? It's very easy to be focused on being the most popular having the most views or followers or likes or we treats, having the most money, having the biggest title, having the most leisure and free time, having the most opportunity to spend time in my favorite hobbies, um, wanting to be in charge of my own schedule and my destiny. And all of those endeavors, like quarreling and fighting, end up ultimately being earthly. They just don't matter in the long run. And this is what Paul is asking the church, how much of your daily activity will matter during your eternal life? How much of your daily activity will matter during your eternal life? When I was in college, um, the internet was still a relatively new thing. So, I am so old, um, and you say, how old are you? I am so old. Um, that I remember a time before computers and before the internet. I remember the first computer coming out. I remember the first um, internet game I ever played. Uh, and I was like really into video games because they were all new and exciting. And I remember in college, my sophomore year, something really strange happened. One of my friends had a birthday, and we all played this video game together. And um, we decided to chip in and buy him a sword. Not a sword that you could like hold in real life. We bought him a sword in the video game, okay? So, no kidding. This is my first experience with in-app purchases, right, which is like all the rage now. We were like, we'll give you real money, and you give us an imaginary sword that his imaginary video game character can use to run around and kill imaginary skeletons or whatever they were. I don't remember. Uh, It was bizarre, right? And yet, um, I think there are plenty of times in our lives Um, where um, we think about um, our lives as though they are video games, right? I mean, in a video game, you want to get the best sword. You want to level up your character. You want to uh, set records. And, And the problem with all of that stuff, as fun as it is, is it doesn't have any value for you outside of the game. And outside of that video game, being the fastest person in Super Mario Brothers or having the best sword in your Swords and Warriors game doesn't really do anything for you. You still got to pay your bills and make some money and learn to cook dinner and learn to do laundry and make some friends and all those things. I think Paul's concern is that when we are living lives of earthly significance, it's as though we are playing a video game and thinking it matters where he's saying, hey, all this stuff that seems so important to you in this life will be irrelevant in the next life. So, why is it your focus? Why are you spending money and time and energy on things that don't matter when Jesus comes back? Because one day, and and Paul calls it in verse 13, the day, one day Jesus will come back and all our time spent on things of earthly significance will be insignificant. It'll be wasted time. Like a teenager or a young adult spending their lives playing video games and not knowing how to be an adult. And so this is the question that Paul is posing for the Corinthian church. What kind of vessel are you? Um, Are are you a vessel made of wood and hay and straw, or are you a vessel made of gold and silver and precious stones that will last? Are you an infant or are you an adult? There's a a term 
that my generation has coined for what it means to grow up. We call it adulting, right? Uh, and it is the difficult process of moving from being an adolescent. There's research that says nowadays adolescence is from 13 to 30, um, which is kind of disturbing in itself. Um, but the process of moving from an adolescent to an adult we call adulting. Uh, and uh, if you're not familiar with this term, there's a YouTube channel called The Holderness Family, and they do a wonderful job explaining adulting in music. And so I'm going to play that for you. Hey, I'm going to take off early, beat the traffic. Hey, will you pick up my prescription? Of course. Adulting. Yeah, she made it to her meeting on time. I'm adulting. I fertilized my grass with some lime. I'm adulting. She's folding 20 towels on the red. I'm adulting. I made a frittata with some eggs. I'm adulting. Remember 20 years ago, I was a bro. Went out really late, ate raw cookie dough. She watched 20 TV shows, drank a bottle of Bordeaux. Felt fine the next day, went to a club till four. 20 years later, we don't frequent those facilities. We always check the web. When we plan our activities, we're sleepy at 8.30 and we water our backyard, yeah. We are adulting so hard. I clean between my toes in the shower. I'm adulting. She sat in carpool for an hour. I'm adulting. I put a bill in an envelope. I'm adulting. She sliced up a whole cantaloupe. I'm adulting. Don't make fun of my adulting. That's insulting. Got a job in consulting. And it's resulting in a paycheck that goes into a budget every day. And a little bit goes into my 401k. 401k. So good. All right. I love it. Um, this, this is what we're called to think about. What does it mean to adult as a person in faith? Uh, and I think Paul would argue it means to live a life of eternal significance. It means to recognize uh, that everything that we do has the potential to be connected to the eternal life of Christ. So help me really quick um, with some of Paul's metaphors. Um, so if the infants drink milk, what does Paul say the adults are, are to consume? Solid food. All right, solid food. And um, if the, um, the temporary building is made with wood, hay, and straw, what's the eternal building made with? Great. Gold, silver, precious stones. I can't even spell silver. Boy, this is stressful. Okay. <laughs> precious stones. Great. Uh, and then, here's the question, um, if, if the alternative is to be merely human, um, what is a life of eternally significant living called? I'm not sure he tells us. Uh, I'm just going to call it more than merely human. Okay. Dallas Willard, who is… Um, one of the great thinkers of the 20th century, um, discusses the fundamental need of the human life. He says in his book, Renovation of the Heart, accordingly, the greatest need you and I have, the greatest need of collective humanity is renovation of our heart, that spiritual place within us from which our outlook, choices, and actions come has been formed by a world away from God. Now it must be transformed. The revolution of Jesus is in the first place and continuously a revolution of the human heart or spirit. It did not and does not proceed by means of the formation of social institutions and laws, the outer forms of our existence, intending that these would then impose a good order of life upon people who come under their power. Rather, His is a revolution of character, which proceeds by changing people from the inside through an ongoing personal relationship to God and Christ and to one another. It is one that changes their ideas, beliefs, feelings, and habits of choice, as well as their bodily tendencies and social relations. It penetrates to the deepest layers of their soul. External social arrangements may be useful to this end, but they are not the end, nor are they a fundamental part of the means. On the other hand, those from those divinely renovated depths of the person, social structures will naturally be transformed so that justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Such streams cannot flow through corrupted souls. 
Conversely, a renovated within will not cooperate with public streams of unrighteousness. It will block them or die trying. It is the only thing that can do so. Paul says, our hearts need to experience renovation. We need to become more than merely human. We need to become temples of God that are built eternally significant so that the presence of God can dwell within us and so that we can be the vessels of, that carry God into the world. Um, I, I come back to this passage briefly in 1 Kings where Solomon builds a temple for God uh, and there's a really interesting moment uh, in this passage. Solomon says, um, there's a cloud, right, that appears in the sanctuary. And Solomon says, the Lord said He would dwell in thick darkness. It's a weird phrase, thick darkness. It only shows up a few times in the Bible, only twice in, uh, like, we are seeing this happen. Once is here. The other place is on Mount Sinai. When God shows up on Mount Sinai to audibly speak the Ten Commandments to the people of God and make the Old Testament covenant, it's described as a moment of thick darkness. Uh, and, and I think what we are to take away is that the same extraordinary presence of God that was present on Mount Sinai in the defining moment of the Old Testament is present in the temple when God decides to live with His people in this permanent way, and then because of Jesus is present in us, we get that extraordinary, unbelievable experience of God living within us in such a way that we become more than merely human. We become something new. And, and this journey, um, this journey of, of moving from earthly to eternal significance requires really, I think, two critical steps today. There's more in your life, but let's take two today. Uh, the first is really simple. It's a recognition that when we become Christians, we start living our eternal life. When we become Christians, we start living our eternal life, that this life is part of that life, right? And, and so, um, it is not the case that nothing that I do now will matter when I get to heaven. It is the case that I cannot earn God's love or affection or earn my way into heaven. I get that by the grace of Jesus. But it is not the case that my life now is irrelevant for my life then. In fact, Paul's central point in this passage as he talks about building upon the foundation of Jesus is that you can build things now in this life that will matter in your eternal life. Or you can spend your life of earthly significance in such a way that you'll make it into heaven, but with nothing to show for who you were and what you did on earth. He says, you can build with wood, hay, and straw. It'll get burned up on the day of Christ's return. You're going to make it to heaven, but with nothing to take away from your earthly life. Or you can build with gold and silver and precious stones and what you do in your life can matter in your next life. By the way, um, we said this before, but it's such an important concept. Because we all get into heaven for free, sometimes we think it means we're all equals in heaven. I do not believe that will be the case. I do not believe that when you come to the pearly gates, you get a standard issue harp and toga and cloud, and you go float around for the rest of eternity. Um, I believe that the whole purpose of eternity is identical to the whole purpose of your earthly life now, which is to become more like Jesus. And so any progress that you make in becoming more like Jesus in this life will have value in that next life. You will be further ahead in the journey. This is why Jesus talks about storing up treasure for yourselves in heaven. This is why Jesus talks about parables where um, people live their lives well and are given additional responsibility and privilege in the next life. This is what Paul means when he says, um, what the builder has made on the foundation will pass through and the builder will receive a reward. And so the question for us is, do we recognize that our daily activity can be of eternal value? Do we recognize um, that we have the opportunity right now to be already living part of our eternal life? Or are we stuck in the video game world thinking that earthly significant things matter? 
So first thing we do is a recognition. The second thing we do is really simple. It's a decision. It's a decision to recognize. It's a decision to, uh, to act with Jesus, to say that anything almost, let's not say anything, almost anything can be part of my eternally significant life if I do it with Jesus. And conversely, almost anything can be of earthly significance if I leave Jesus out of it. So, there are some careers that seem intrinsically good, right? I mean, if you are a, a, a doctor saving lives on a regular basis, that seems intrinsically good to me, right? But if you do that apart from Jesus, if you do that with no thought for um, the way you might glorify God or the way you might love your neighbor, if you do it because you get a cool title and a cool car and the respect of other people, if you do it for you, it doesn't have eternal significance. It just has earthly significance. In the same way, uh, if you do the most mundane of tasks and you do it in such a way uh, that you involve Christ in it and you find um, His presence fills you as you do it, that task may be eternally significant. I I come back all the time to the movie Chariots of Fire. Uh, Who's seen Chariots of Fire? Okay, fantastic. Uh, quick reminder if you've not seen the movie, but Eric Liddell is one of its main characters. Eric is born to a missionary family in China. And in that film, he also, actually, in re- it's a true story in real life as well. He's also an incredible runner. He qualifies for the Olympic team. Uh, he's, he's Scottish originally. And so he and his family are debating what he's going to do. Will he go back to China to be a missionary or will he run in the Olympics? And his family thinks that running is trivial, right? Just entertainment. It's just games. Why does that matter? Um, Mission work, obviously, bringing people to Jesus has eternal significance. Uh, And in the movie, as in real life, he has this incredible conversation with his sister, and I just want to play that conversation for you. I've decided I'm going back to China. The missionary service have accepted me. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm so pleased. <laughs> I've got a lot of running to do first. Jenny. Jenny, you've got to understand. I believe that God made me for a purpose. For China. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. To give it up would be to hold them in contempt. You were right. It's not just fun. To win is to honor Him. I come back to that all the time, right? That if I'm doing it with God, if I'm doing it with Jesus, then running can be honoring God, and running can be a way to feel His pleasure. There is almost no activity that can be not eternally significant if we simply do it with Jesus. There is literally no activity that is eternally significant if we do it without Him. And so, um, very simply, Paul says, you have all of this opportunity. You have all of this opportunity to live an eternally significant life that comes from a renovated, eternally minded heart. And whatever that you do, if you do it with Jesus, It matters. He says, all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. The eternally significant life makes us into a vessel that has value in this life and into the next, into a house in which the Lord delights to reside, uh, into people who are adults in Christ. This this is such a critical step because if we don't live with that eternally minded focus, um, no matter how often we try to refill with the Spirit, um, we will end up feeling empty again. And if we choose to live eternally significant lives, no matter how long we wait or what journeys we go through, the Spirit of God will pour out of us into the world and transform the lives around us. Solomon says, I have built you a temple 
in which you can live forever. Solomon speaking metaphorically, that temple only lasts about 500 years. You are literally a temple in which God can live forever. Choose to build your temple with an eternally significant life so that you might be an adult in Christ, so that you might be more than merely human. Thanks be to God. Amen.